Hello, my name is John Jacobson. I'm a musculoskeletal radiologist from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. My lecture will be on peripheral nerve ultrasound. A few disclosures. I'm a consultant for Bioclinica, and I receive book royalties from Elsevier. Note that images from this lecture are in the textbook and copyrighted by Elsevier. So what do peripheral nerves look like normally by ultrasound? Well, they're best seen in short axis, where they have a characteristic honeycomb appearance. You'll see the individual hypoechoic nerve fascicles separated by the hyperechoic connective tissue layers, this being the median nerve in the carpal tunnel. Of course, as the nerve uh, travels more distally and arborizes, you'll have less and less fascicles. But when you have a nerve trunk like this, it looks like a honeycomb. Note here on this cine clip, I'm toggling the transducer. I'm doing this on purpose to bring out anisotropy of the adjacent tendons to show how we can differentiate a peripheral nerve from a tendon using anisotropy to our advantage. So the most common reason we perform ultrasound of peripheral nerves is to diagnose nerve entrapment. So what are the findings of nerve entrapment by ultrasound? Well, they're the same anywhere in the body, and that is when a nerve is traveling into an enclosed space, like a fibrosis canal, where it's being entrapped, the nerve will become hypochoic and enlarge at and proximal to the entrapment site. And this is often best appreciated in short axis. As we scan from proximal to distal, you'll see the nerve, which is usually uniform, start to get enlarged and hypochoic, and then transition back to normal as it enters into the entrapped site. Also keep in mind when looking for, looking for entrapment neuropathies is to evaluate the end organ or the muscle to look for changes related to the entrapment. So we'll be looking for denervation. What can happen in this scenario is fat can be infiltrated into the muscle, and because the fat is interdigitating with the muscle fibers, there are increased interfaces, and therefore the muscle will become abnormally increased in echogenicity. With more significant cases, the muscle will decrease in size, and then we can use the term atrophy. So here's a case looking at the tibialis anterior muscle, the normal short axis, with the hypochoic muscle and the echogenic fibro fatty layers. Here, the muscle is abnormally hypoechoic due to fatty infiltration, decreased in size, so now we can use the term atrophy. What's important when looking for atrophy is to compare to the other side, set your gain appropriately, and then look at the symptomatic side. Because many times when we look at this image, we have a tendency to decrease the gain to try the muscle, make the muscle look normal. We're going to talk about four nerve entrapment syndromes in this lecture. First, the carpal tunnel syndrome, looking at the median nerve in the wrist. So the hallmark of this uh, syndrome would be enlargement of the nerve at and proximal to the entrapment site at the wrist crease. So if you look proximally, this is the normal nerve. And right at the wrist crease, under the retinoculum, we see it's hypochoic and enlarged. So when moving in short axis from proximal to distal, this is a classic finding. Now, if you choose to make measurements, you could do a circumferential trace underneath the epineurium. And if there's a difference of 2 millimeters square or more, that's a 99% sensitivity and 100% specificity. Here's a companion case. Again, the normal median nerve. And this is abnormal. The echogenic fibro the connective tissue layers are more hypochoic from edema. In fact, if we look in the long axis, the nerve gets larger and larger and more hypochoic as it enters into the carpal tunnel. As we look at this cine clip, the nerve here going distally is getting larger and more hypochoic as it enters into the carpal tunnel. Again, normal, now becoming hypochoic, now becoming enlarged, going from proximal to distal. As a normal variant, some patients may have a bifid median nerve. In this case, usually there's an interposed persistent median artery in between. To diagnose carpal tunnel syndrome here, you can simply add the area in four millimeter square is the threshold in this case to diagnose carpal tunnel syndrome. But the findings are the same, which is hypochoic enlargement of the nerve as it gets close to the entrapment site in the carpal tunnel. Let's move on to cubital tunnel syndrome in the elbow looking at the ulnar nerve. The anatomy here shows the ulnar nerve going behind the elbow and entering into the true cubital tunnel between the two heads of the flexor carpi ulnaris underneath the arcuate ligament. 
So remember, if we're looking for abnormal hypochoic swelling of a nerve, we're going to look at and proximal to the entrapment. So we're going to look behind the medial epicondyle for this abnormality. So here we can see an enlarged ulnar nerve. As we look distally, it's becoming more and more hypoechoic, more enlarged, and a transition underneath the arcuate ligament into the cubital tunnel. The number here is 9.5 millimeters square as a threshold, but the numbers have been variable in the literature. Here we've seen short axis, the enlargement as it's entering into the true cubital tunnel underneath the arcuate ligament. As a normal variant, some patients may have an enconius epitrochlearis. Here on this MRI, turned upside down to simulate the ultrasound, we can see this extra layer of muscle. This can cause entrapment and compression of the ulnar nerve. It's important not to mistake this for a mass. Note the fibers here that are characteristic of muscle and the characteristic location and course. Now, when looking at the ulnar nerve, we also need to think about dynamic evaluation, looking for ulnar nerve dislocation, because this can produce symptoms as well. So we image while bending the elbow into flexion. Normally, the ulnar nerve should stay behind the medial epicondyle. Abnormally, it can dislocate over the epicondyle. This can be seen in 20% of asymptomatic volunteers, but repetitive dislocation can indeed cause irritation. So here we can see the normal ulnar nerve behind the epicondyle. With flexion, it should stay behind the apex of the epicondyle. But in this case, as we flex, we follow the ulnar nerve. Rather than staying behind, it moves over the top and snaps right there. And then as we extend the elbow, it reduces. Be careful not to apply too much pressure because you can inhibit the dislocation of the ulnar nerve. And as we leave the elbow, we need to mention tricep syndrome. Snapping tricep syndrome is a condition where not only does the ulnar nerve dislocate, but the medial head of the triceps shows subluxation over the apex as well. And you may hear or feel two different snaps. So as I start the video clip, I'm going to freeze this in neutral position. So as I stop right here, we can see the apex of the medial epicondyle, the normal position of the ulnar nerve, and the triceps, which already looks somewhat large. Now as we flex, these structures should stay behind the apex. As we start the video clip and we flex the elbow, the ulnar nerve snaps and then the tricep snaps and they're in contact with each other. And as we extend, the triceps will now move back right there and the ulnar nerve second. So you can feel two snaps often through the transducer. Moving on to the perineal tendon, we're going to look specifically at the intraneural common perineal cyst. So the perineal intraneural ganglion occurs from fluid extending from the tibiofibular joint. In fact, it's been shown that in 20% of the patients who have foot drop, this can be the cause for the compression and the foot drop. So the continuity from the joint has been proven with MR arthrography that if you inject contrast into the knee joint, it can go into the tibiofibular joint, and then with, with weight bearing, it can go into this internal ganglion cyst. It may also go into the tibial nerve, but less commonly. Here, taken from the literature, Dr. Spinner's articles on this well illustrate the pathophysiology of the perineal intraneural ganglion. So the fluid in the tibiofibular joint can connect through this articular branch and work its way up through the common perineal nerve. It can go up into the sciatic nerve, it can go back on the tibial nerve, it can even come up the tibial nerve. So the key is when you see a cyst around the tibiofibular joint, although you might think about uh, a, a synovial cyst or a non-specific ganglion, you need to see if it's tracking along the course of the common perineal nerve. They call this an intraneural ganglion cyst. Here's an example of MR correlation showing the articular branch with fluid tracking along. Here is the ganglion cyst next to the common perineal nerve. They call this the signet ring sign. Here is the cyst. The nerve is next to it, multilocular like most ganglion cysts, and here it's wrapping around the fibula. So the key is it's going to track along the common perineal nerve throughout its course. This case is a very large intraneural ganglion cyst. It's over 15 centimeters long. It's going up into the sciatic nerve. Again, multilocular, tracking along the common perineal nerve. Note the edema in the muscle, a sign of denervation by MR, and then the increased echogenicity indicating fatty infiltration. Then finally, we're going to finish with Morton neuroma involving entrapment of the interdigital nerve in the forefoot. So between the metatarsal heads, this nerve can be entrapped, causing edema, fibrosis, and necrosis. 
The third in a metatarsal space is more common than the second. People who are prone to this are those who have pliable uh, shoes, high heel shoes, and those with narrow-toed uh, shoes that will cause compression, that with weight-bearing, the metatarsal heads will push on this nerve, causing entrapment. So ultrasound works pretty well when looking for these neuromas. Five millimeter mass, you can see these with 100% sensitivity. You can see them smaller than this, but it becomes more difficult. Looking for the nerve and continuity in long axis is helpful. Remember that bursa live in this location, so it's important to differentiate bursa from neuroma. So how does one do this? Well, bursa tend to be more anechoic, and neuromas tend to be more hypoechoic. Also, with compression, bursa tend to compress, and neuromas tend to not compress. So here is an aroma on MR showing this teardrop-shaped mass coming in a plantar direction. Here it is by ultrasound. Note that I tend to scan from a plantar approach, 90 degrees to the metatarsals, applying pressure with my other finger, separating out the metatarsal heads, allowing me to see between the metatarsal heads, and also trying to induce symptoms by compressing the neuroma between my finger and the transducer. The long axis view is very important because here we can see the edematous nerve going into the neuroma. When you start to see a more anechoic area, that's likely the adjacent intermetatarsal bursa. So what has been a very helpful sign to increase accuracy is the Mulder's sign. Now, Dr. Mulder described a clinical test where if you press the foot together from the sides and compress the metatarsals together, this can produce a palpable click and symptoms that can indicate more to neuroma. Well, we use a very similar sign with ultrasound. We scan from a plantar aspect in the coronal plane or short axis of the metatarsals, from a plantar aspect, and we will squeeze the foot from side to side. And this helps us in three ways in improving our accuracy. So here's neutral, cross-section of the metatarsal heads. This is the normal intermetatarsal space. This is abnormal. As I start the cine clip, we can see the neuroma moving in a plantar direction. So this maneuver helps, it, uh, helps us in three ways. First of all, when you squeeze the foot together, the neuroma is pushed in a plantar direction. So we see it better. So that improves our accuracy. The second thing, the compression that occurs helps us differentiate the neuroma from a bursa. The bursa usually compress and don't move to this extent, where the neuromas tend not to compress and move more. And the third reason this helps is the clicking that occurs, reproducing the symptoms, is further evidence that indeed this is a Morton neuroma. So the take-home points for this lecture on peripheral nerve ultrasound. First of all, we reviewed entrapment neuropathy. Basically, in the extremities, there are specific nerves that have distinct sites of possible entrapment. And the findings anywhere in the body are the same. Hypocoke enlargement at and proximal to the entrapment site. And if you push the with the transducer on the involved nerve, it can reproduce symptoms. The second point, we talked about the intraneural ganglion cyst, the classic appearance where it tra travels along the common perineal nerve. It's important to differentiate this from a nonspecific synovial cyst from the tibiofibular joint. Then finally, we highlighted the importance of dynamic imaging and peripheral nerve ultrasound. First, ulnar nerve in the elbow, looking for ulnar nerve dislocation, and also snapping tricep syndrome. And finally, looking at Morton neuroma with the Mulder sign where we can increase our accuracy in the diagnosis of Morton neuroma. Thank you very much for your attention.